Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Dialogue, the Dire Point podcast. Today, we're doing things a little bit opposite. I'm going to be interviewed today, um, and that wasn't really by design. Our um, lovely digital marketing manager, Atoka God, is with us, and this summer, she said to me, you need to do more videos for our social media, and I said, oh, do I have to? She's like, yes. And then she sent me a list of questions and topics and different things that she's heard me talk about Aaron over the summer or different things we talk about at work or whatever. And I looked at them all and I said, this is like a really good long format detailed video because it was a full full page of many questions that I thought other people might have similar questions. Other people might be facing similar things. So then I said, huh why don't we do a podcast episode where you can interview me and ask me any questions you want about diabetes, raising a child with diabetes or anything maybe health related, what, whatever it is. But we're mostly going to talk about diabetes, I think, today. Um, so, Toka, I am going to turn it over to you now and uh, take it away. So actually, I remember the idea came to me to discuss this with you when I was having breakfast with you here in Istanbul. And Aaron was there and I heard him talk about the camp. And I remember he didn't mention being scared or nervous about anything diabetes related. He seemed very calm, very prepared. And we joked that his biggest concern was that he doesn't speak Turkish, as you just said. And that had me thinking, this is the first time you sent him independently for more than a day, a few days at a time to take care of his diabetes um, by himself. Mm -hmm. And he's this prepared and you're this calm. And I'm sure many mothers would struggle to be this calm in this situation. <laughs> so I need you to help us share the experience with them so they know how to be this calm. That's why I prepared some questions for you. Yeah, thank you. So calm with... on the outside, but maybe not so much on the inside. thing that he, we talked about was he isn't too keen on changing the sensor that he wears because he puts it on the back of his arm. And even I think it's an adult that is hard to reach. I don't know if you do it down here, but he didn't, he didn't want to do it. I said, what are you going to do if your sensor falls off at camp? He said, well, you're going to come change it. And I said, well, I'm kind of staying like an hour away. I don't know. You know, you could check your finger or do something else. or you could just put the sensor back on. And he said, no, he, he can change insertion sites and do a lot of other things, but that, you know, if he was concerned about anything, it was that, but he wasn't too worried about it because we use the tape that we sell in the shop, the stay put, and it really stays on. He wasn't, he wasn't worried about it coming off, but in the event that it did, he just thought I would show up and do it. I didn't have to, um, but he, even when he goes to school and other things, usually the things that he might complain about or feel challenged with are the typical teenage social things, which is fantastic. And I think uh, we talked about this, that school is actually like a mini camp or a day camp. So the lessons a mother can take away from this experience can be easily applied to school because that's really when your kids leave you for eight hours at a time and you have to trust them and everyone around them with their diabetes management. So how long was the camp? And also how long did it take you to decide that he's ready to do this? Mm, that's a really good question. The camp was five days, I think six nights. And the timing was amazing because we put a sensor on in the morning and the sensor expired just when I picked him up at camp, it was beautiful. <laughs> so the sensor six days, so maybe it was six days. It was five, five nights and six days. Um, and, you know, really great facility, really wonderful, everything. Um, how did I decide to do it? I don't know when, uh, I know when it was propo proposed. So we were talking with a, a good friend of ours in Turkey, um, about, because in four years time, he'll be at university. And we were asking about, you know, camps or other things that he can do to get some experience, real life experience. Mm -hmm. um, while he's in, in Turkey for the summer and while we're there working. And she said, oh, there's a really great space camp in Izmir. So we went and we looked. And of course, I knew it wasn't going to be a diabetic space camp, um, although that would be really cool. NASA, if you're listening, <laughs> I think you should start this program. Yeah. Um, it, there could be a lot of interesting things about managing diabetes in space that people might need to know about in the future. Um, 
sorry, it's the creator in me. I can't turn it off. <laughs> it, it. it comes up all the time. And when we were looking and, you know, I still, of course, I was nervous about it, but it's just like you said, going to school is a really good analogy. As scary mm -hmm. and frightening as it is, I know he has to step out of his comfort zone to continue to grow up, take responsibility and move forward, just like anything. Mm -hmm. And that makes me, I have to move out of my comfort zone of being his primary caretaker and managing it because what I don't want the fear of him going off to university in four years and not being able to manage his own diabetes is greater than the fear of sending him off to camp. So if I want him to be a happy, healthy, productive adult, then I know that we need to do the work and lay the foundation now. Um, mm -hmm. And that's how the internal discussion that I have with myself. I don't, I don't really, I never thought about it before, but I did have those thoughts like, well, initially when I'm warming up to the idea and getting myself used to it, those are the internal conversations that I would have. And I'd be like, okay, come on, just, we have to do this. It's like, if you, you gotta, you know, you want to learn to swim, you got to jump in the pool eventually. Mm -hmm. So I do want to ask you if approaching the camp dates, you started hesitating or even let's call it freaking out a little <laughs> bit, but I want to keep that till um, the end first. Okay to know if there are certain things that helped Aaron be more prepared that we can discuss so others can learn from. So for example, let's start with any products or technologies that he's used to or supported him, made you more confident with the experience or that you want to recommend to other moms. Technology wise, Aaron's always been on an insulin pump. Um, He's never had, and, and when he started pumping or was diagnosed, there weren't a lot of CGMs in the market, like, you know, the Dexcoms of the world and all of that was not there. And so we lived, I say blindly because Dexcom and a few others have an app that you can share the numbers with somebody. So the parents often see in real time what their child's data was. We never had that. So I was living kind of naively or blindly with, with his numbers a lot, unless the school nurse called. So I was kind of used to that. And he still uses the same pump technology. Um, I don't see the data at all until after I'm looking at the screen. But the beauty of his pump is that it will suspend before low. So one of the bigger concerns that I probably would have had before he had this technology would be having a severe low in the middle of the night, nobody being aware of it, and nobody knowing what to do. But because so I know the CGM. Hmm? I didn't know that you had no visibility of his. Uh, oh, no, no, not 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 with this particular um, brand. I, it's a great pump. It, it's wonderful. I don't think it's bad. Um, you know, we're at diet, a diet point. We're agnostic. Mm -hmm. We use the pump that we use. Um, it's Medtronic. We use it because when Aaron was diagnosed, how I had the. I want to say the foresight, the like actual thinking process to say what is available in Dubai. And at that time, I think it was only Medtronic. And I said, let's do that because it's easy to get the supplies. I don't want to be stressed out about my child's health and then worry about not being able to get a supply. So we started with it and we continued with it, but I still have no visibility. Like he's at school today, eating lunch, doing all the school things. They have PE today, first time this year. We have no idea what activity he's doing, but I know now he's 14, he's got it. I know the school nurses know what they're doing. Um, so that technology made me feel more comfortable just knowing that he's safe when he's sleeping or if he's doing an activity or something like that. Um, as we got closer to the time, I did notice there were a couple days where I'm just like, this is absolutely crazy. What am I doing? Like sending my kid off to camp <laughs> and, and the week before or so, or the couple of weeks, he, he was Again, nothing to do with the diabetes at all, but anticipating the social aspect of it that he thought he would be left out because maybe his Turkish wouldn't be as good as everyone else's. And he just carried a long face because he was worried about it from, from, you know, for, I think for some kids, you know, it's kind of, it's yeah. nervous to go off to camp somewhere if you don't know anyone. And then when we got there and we're dropping him off and I did see there were a few kids from the same school or friends and they knew each other and they're hanging out and 
he was there yeah and he didn't feel left out I mean there were some kids that were there by themselves and Aaron was always really great with kids that were maybe a couple years younger than him I would see him like you know somebody dropped a ball and he'd pick it up and take it back or whatever so you know he the the look when we when we left him I could feel it like I still feel it but but yeah but you know it again the fear of him not being able to care for himself as an adult and it was is is a bigger fear because it's my I always tell myself and you know for other parents where we have all these fears of uh, somebody just um I was asked a question the other day like what do you do when your child's at school someone had a really young child and they were afraid to even get injections at school mm -hmm. and you know, I just kind of look at it from, you know, what, what is it that I have to push through to help my child to push through to make sure that they continue to progress and, and grow up and be, you know, happy and healthy. It's, it's all about that at the end of the day. So sometimes those challenging social situations, you can see it in their face and you feel it, but you know that they're going to come out better for it than have to like go to the fear or lean into the fear, I should say. Um, so I think I may have cut you off a bit when you were talking about products, if you want to say any more. No. But the reason I did is because you impressed me even more when I found out that you didn't see his levels. Uh, I thought you had visibility when he was uh, off his camp. And no. that brings more questions to my mind right mm -hmm. now. For example, do you think that not having this visibility is important in teaching Aaron independence in his diabetes care? I think it depends. Yes and no. Even if I did have visibility, he would still have to be the one to take the action or to mm -hmm. manage it. Not having it means that, yes, he does have to make the decisions. If I could see like there was one night, the only visibility I had was at the end of the day, the nurse would call me, give me an overview. And I asked um, Aaron to fix the, the pump screen so I could see the graph of the day just to see what happened. Um, and in general, he did really a great job at managing, like better than I expected. Uh, but there was, for example, one day where um, one dinner they had like kebabs and all this other great Turkish food and and Aaron meat causes a lot of insulin resistance um, so you know if I if I could see graphs like that I would probably end up constantly interrupting constantly calling the nurse at the camp to go check on him go do you know the things and and that's okay and and you want you know of course you want the blood sugar managed as good as possible and in in range as much as possible but there's also like a fine line and it's hard to find that balance if you always know and you're always having the nurse run after the child if they're very small then that's kind of probably a different story but they have to learn how to manage it you still want them to be enjoying their time relatively normally not not ignoring the diabetes but knowing that it's there and that they need to check in with it so so yeah, I don't have a perfect answer for that question. But, but it's not having the visibility helped you let go a little bit as well. I think so. Otherwise, I'd be constantly there. Now, when he's in another continent, perhaps going to university, maybe I will want to see it. Because if, if he's living alone, it's, it's very different than, you know, and he probably won't live alone. He'll be in a dorm and there'll be other people. But I think if you are living alone and you have access to the technology, I think it's really great to share it with someone because, you know, things do happen. If you're in a, like a dorm situation, which they had rooms and other room, you know, roommates, someone would come by and check, but if the pump alarms, then, you know, someone will wake up and wake you up. But, but if you're living alone as an adult, even I think giving that access to someone, if you can, is, is really helpful. Okay. So uh, another thing that I want to ask you in regards to technology, do you think that an insulin pump is essential for a child's independence and in his diabetes care? No, I don't. And the reason for that is because there have been people managing diabetes before insulin pumps were available. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people in the world, particularly in this region, who 
can't afford insulin pumps or for one reason or another, that technology is not available in their country they, and they cannot access to it. We are incredibly privileged that we have a pump, that we can afford a pump and that my child can grow up in this way. It does make some things easier, but I don't think it's necessary. And that brings me to another point that a lot of parents sometimes will feel bad or depending on you know what how they feel about it they'll feel bad maybe if their child refuses a pump they'll go out and buy an expensive pump and their child absolutely hates it and you really need your child to embrace the technology because then socially or psychologically if they don't feel good wearing it then that creates a bad relationship with their diabetes and then you want to support them in helping them to feel good They'll eventually maybe warm up to getting the pump. Maybe not, but you want to manage it in the best way that you can, in the way that you have access and what you can afford and what works for you and your family. So it's it's not the, the come all end all. I do like certain features of it. It gives me peace of mind. It makes it easier that you can still have really good diabetes management without a pump. And knowing you and also meeting Erin, I think I also saw that pump or not, there are things that you taught him and trained him to be independent regardless of what technology he's using when it comes to his diabetes management. So that brings me to my next question. When did you start? Because like you just said, when the kids are still small, you don't really have to focus on making them independent when it comes to managing their diabetes. When did you start focusing on that with Aaron and how did you do it? How did you help him um, not be fully dependent on you when it comes to this? Mm. And also if you have any inside jokes or anything like certain things as a mother that when you dropped him off at camp, you had to make sure he remembers like Aaron, do not forget that. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure I was like, hey, don't forget to check your blood sugar. Maybe you want to put it on vibrate for the, the high alerts at night because the, you know, we have a range on the pump and if he's excited or having fun, that thing's going to go off all night and he won't get sleep. His other campers won't get sleep. Of course, we want him to be alarmed. It'll vibrate, but we want him to be alarmed if it's like low or something else. So, so those were kind of the main things. Like, don't forget to check. Um, I'm sure there's probably other things that I would have said if he's here, I'm sure he'd have a whole host of things he would share with you next time yeah yeah um the, how did and the other question uh how did I prepare him to be independent and when did you start and when did I start so I was told by the first medical team that we saw in the U.S. when there were were no, was no one here or we didn't know of anyone here that could support us they said statistically, and this is like a U.S. statistic at that time, a lot of children around age seven would start doing things independently. Not everything, but a lot of things. Aaron started independently later than that. And I think there's a few reasons for that, because, you know, he always had support and someone there um, in Dubai. We we have help at home. So he wasn't like this, as they call it in U.S., like a latchkey kid where He'd go home by himself after school in fourth grade and just be alone and have to do it. There, there are a lot of kids that that do that. And I love that because you take on responsibility at a very early age. It wasn't until like the fourth or fifth grade. So how old would he have been? Like 10 or so, like the kind of tweens at, you know, just before middle school. Fourth and fifth grade was when I felt that he could do more and he could be ready. And also by the nature of the size of the school he was at at the time and the nurses were quite busy and I wanted him to do more independently because I knew that he knew more about his diabetes than a lot of nurses that have no experience with diabetes. And I'm not saying that nurses don't know anything. Don't, yeah, if you're listening out there and you're a school nurse, please don't misunderstand. But school nurses are not pediatric endocrinology nurses, nor are they diabetes educators. And I would see Aaron go into doctor's appointments and speak with an educator or a dietitian, and they would ask him questions. And he would just be like this, this, this. I mean, he could answer it because he's been living with it since he's 20 months old. It's not that I taught him anything special. 
I would just always make sure from a very young age to explain as much as I could that was age appropriate, carbs, how things work, how insulin works in your body, how, because I wanted him to be able also to advocate for himself from a very young age. And in school, he would, before he could read, the teacher would read it. They would read a book about diabetes that was age appropriate for children. And then once he reminded me the other day, once he learned how to read, he would read the book himself and then he would answer any questions. And then when they started to call me in the health office from fourth and fifth grade around that time, um, when they would say, okay, this is the blood sugar, this is what Aaron would eat. And then I would ask to speak to Aaron, which is kind of an unusual thing. You don't have contact with your child while they're at school. But I would ask Aaron, I would say, what, what do you think? Because that was the most powerful question. I always say, this is why I think coaching is so important in diabetes. And I'm not saying this just because I'm a coach. The most important question that I could not understand at the time when we were a newly diagnosed family or my son was newly diagnosed, the doctor that we saw was amazing. And one night in the middle of the night, a few days after Aaron got his pump and I'm leaning over the bed and I'm freaking out because his blood sugar was high and I didn't know what to do. And I called the, you know, the number he gave me, he's like, call anytime I use that. I, I usually don't call doctors at midnight, but I was calling at midnight, like every other day. And I asked him a question. I said, you know, Aaron's blood sugar was like this. And he goes, well, what do you think? And I'm like, what do you mean? What do I think? Like, you're the doctor. You're supposed you? to tell me what to think. I don't, I don't. And, and this is where for any kind of chronic condition in our health, where I think sometimes we get it all wrong. We want the answers. We just want answers. We just want the solution. We don't want to have to think about it. And if I've learned anything from Aaron having a chronic condition is that we don't always have the answers and we have to find the answers on our own and we have to teach our kids to find the answers. So from that age, I started asking him when it was time for him to take insulin for lunch, I would say, well, what do you think? Mm -hmm. And then he would tell me what he thinks the, the bolus should be or how much insulin he should give or not give because there was PE. And there were times where I didn't disagree. I mean, I didn't agree with what he was suggesting, mm -hmm. but as long as it wasn't going to cause a severe high or a severe low, or if it was, I would maybe coach him around it and say, well, you have PE or maybe this is going to happen. And what do you think about that? As long as there was nothing severe, if I knew it was like, if I felt, I'm saying new, if I felt as a mom that it was the wrong answer, there were a couple of times where I said, okay, let's try it and see what happens. And a lot of the times when my intuition was saying that is wrong, he was right. Mm -hmm. and it wasn't always perfect. There were times where it didn't work out and then blood sugar was too high or maybe went too low and he needed to, you know, have a juice or adjust it. Not, not again, nothing super severe because I knew he was always safe. And then after we would talk about it and I would say, ah, so after you gave that much insulin, so this happened. So what do you think you would have done differently next time? Mm -hmm. And it's just talking to them about it. And you can start doing this from a really young, young age, probably, I mean, some kids maybe even sooner than I started doing it with Aaron because they know a lot. They're super observant. They hear us one reason why Aaron was able to answer doctors and nurses so well, because curious adults would ask us normal, curious questions, and we would always answer. After hearing you talk about it so much to so many people, they, they learn as well. And I believe what's important here as well is perspective, because as a family, you look at diabetes like it's something manageable and it's part of life, not all of life. And many parents still struggle to see it that way. Many parents still see it as this big, horrible thing that they don't want their children to face emotionally, even more than physically. So there is a mistake that many fall into where they just don't let their kids even worry about it. They don't tell them what they're doing, how they're taking care of them. They just don't want them to worry about it. And it's out of love and good intentions, but that can be very dangerous. So I think accepting diabetes as, yes, it's unlucky, but it's not a nightmare and it's manageable is something that helped you keep Aaron in the conversation and in turn helped him with his independence.
Yeah, that is so true. And I'm glad you pointed that out. I think also those feelings are part of the natural grief cycle that, you know, we're upset, we're angry, and we don't want to, nobody wants their children to have to deal with this. And it, it was a lot, it took me a long time before I got over being angry at diabetes, like really, but I didn't, in the beginning, even I didn't really let my son see that or understand it because I decided very early on I remember that like one day I was incredibly upset and angry but after that time um that one particular day wh whatever set me off and I was like crying in my bathroom like really like that was like it and that's when I said this is not how we're going to live with diabetes if this is what we have then I will do everything that I can to make sure that my son is doing everything else everyone does, everything he wants to do, and it's not going to stop him. I still had days where I hated it. I dreaded diabetes. I hated what, you know, he was facing and what he was doing, but I knew that I had to push through that to make sure that he grew up having this very normalized. Diabetes is not normal. Diabetes is not easy. And there are some days where it still feels like everything is about diabetes. It can really mess up schedules and, and all kinds of other things. It's frustrating, extremely frustrating. But the minute that you decide to start, doesn't have to be every day. Not every day is going to be perfect. But once you decide that, okay, this is here, we're going to deal with it and we're going to live with it. We're going to try to live positively with it. We're not going to fall in love with it, but you know, I, I don't like to say it is what it is because that feels like it oversimplifies it and it's not simple, but that, that was a real conscious decision. And I don't know, I have no idea where that idea or that strength came to me, but I just knew it, it, it had to happen. I, I can't really give you the answer, but I have <laughs> one theory that it might have come from how much you wanted Aaron to not feel like he's not living a normal life. And from how yeah. much you wanted that from your son, you were able to apply that to yourself on how you feel about his diabetes. Yeah, perhaps. I think so. I think so. There's probably some good psychoanalysis out there that could tell you why that happens. But but yeah, I I really don't know. I didn't know. I knew a little bit about diabetes before he was diagnosed. I always worked in healthcare. So we always would see people overcoming um, different conditions and different challenges. And it doesn't always have to be bad. But yeah, if you, while we try to protect our children as much as we can, that in the in the long run, there's there's a time and a place to do that. But in the long run, as they get older, we're doing them a disservice if we're still trying to protect them too much. And some mothers are afraid at time of diagnosis of how little they know. And you just said that you worked in healthcare, so you had some background, but you always also say that even though you had this healthcare background, you learned much more from actually doing it, from taking care of Aaron. And I think that that's a good reminder for mothers that if you don't know, you just have to do it. That's how you're going to learn. You have to. Yeah. And I mean, let me tell you the, what I, what I knew about diabetes. I wasn't a doctor or a nurse. And I can tell you that my husband, Aaron's father is a trained medical doctor. He does healthcare management now, but he worked in an emergency room for a few years before he decided to go into management. He had no idea about diabetes. And even now, if there's someone asks a question about diabetes, he'll come to me and ask, which is ironic and not. Yes, I'm the primary caretaker and I go to conferences and I sit and I listen and I absorb as much as I can so I can help my son and, you know, help other people and direct them to the right place because there's a lot of misinformation out there. But I was a healthcare manager, so I knew endocrinologists. I knew about diabetes because I wrote strategic plans for endocrinology clinics. And I had a dog that they suspected was diabetes. And people would be familiar with the how I figured out that Aaron might have diabetes based on my experience with that dog and drinking too much water. But I had no idea about diabetes. So pretty much unless you're a pediatric endocrinologist or a diabetes educator, 
or working somewhere along the lines of that, all of us start at zero, not knowing anything. Mm -hmm. And I think this forms the basis of our caretaker coaching when it comes to type 1 diabetes, because doctors have the knowledge about the disease, but what we're sharing and coaching is not just that, it's everything else. It's the day-to-day -day management. It's the details that you know, because yes, you're a certified coach, but also because you live these details every day and you live the trial and error and all of that. So it's very 360 degrees it's not just even medication it's what we're discussing right now how to teach your child independence and all the things that you will rarely be able to discuss in a doctor's office exactly yeah we are not coaching people on medical advice at all if mm -hmm. someone comes to a coaching session with a medical question and this happens a lot i coach people that they come to me and they have diabetes and the first question and the questionnaire is, are you seeing a doctor? Are you seeing an endocrinologist? Mm -hmm. When was your last diabetes checkup? And more often than not, they don't have a doctor. You have, to, for, for us to coach you, it is required that you're seeing a doctor because that's your first and foremost goal. I was just listening to a podcast this morning and it was so spot on. They were talking about health and nutrition um, and the one guy has type one diabetes, he's an adult and the other is like a PhD in nutrition and it's super scientific, but he said, when your car breaks down, you, do you fix it yourself? No, you call you take it to a mechanic. If you have a plumbing problem, are you there like pounding holes in your wall to try to fix your plumbing? Unless you have experience, probably not. So why is it when we have, especially in the case of type two diabetes, or insulin resistance or something like this, or maybe you've been type one for a while and you've not gone to the doctor. Why are, is it when we have medical conditions, we're not going to the doctor and you're listening to someone on Instagram that you've never met or a famous person that's promoting a certain diet of the month. Mm -hmm. So that I just wanna really highlight, like you need to have doctors in your life because they need to give you medical advice. When in a coaching session, we might talk about the things that you need to go ask your doctor about, but I just want to make clear that because some doctors are also fearful of coaching because there are some uncertified coaches out there that might be giving medical advice. So I want to just make that really clear that it's separate. What we coach people on is that they need to get medical advice. That's the only medical advice that we'll, we'll give. Um, and then we're experts on everything else. <laughs> ex exactly. And then we coach on the day-to-day -day setting goals, how to deal and manage the, the stress and how to, uh, for a lot of parents, it's how to, and caretakers, how to really take your life back because you lose yourself. You get lost there. I didn't sleep for years, like for years. And my health suffered because of that. And if I had had a coach from the beginning that could have Coach me not necessarily on the diabetes aspect of it, but on my own personal health and wellness and different goals like this. And then also teach me how to help my sunset goals, not define the goals. That's what the, the medical people are there to do. Um, it would have made such a world of difference. But yeah, you're right. We do so much more of this because we have the hands-on experience and we understand it from the 360 degree. So it should complement the medical advice that you're given. And if you're not getting good medical advice, then, you know, we, we don't, we need to find have, yeah, you need to find, you need to find good medical advice because some clients, you know, they'll, they'll come and say, oh, well, I saw this doctor, but, you know, he may have said something that, you know, is kind of a bit far out there. And I said, well, you know, maybe go get your blood checked, go do, you know, there's a list of things that you can do. And, and, the medical advice, like I said, that we give is, is get some. Mm -hmm. And for me, I see this episode as really an example or a reflection of the basis of our diabetes coaching, even if we're focusing on type one at this point. Um, since the beginning, we didn't really talk about dosing or anything medical, but we did talk about everything else that led to the point that now your 14 year old son can go off to an diabetes camp on his own and come back safely and happy. And you're both not stressing out and freaking out all the time about the fact that he has diabetes. And 
of course, medical advice is important and without it, there is nothing we can do, but this is very important too. And it's very rare to find it. And yeah. I do want to focus more on um, the part that has to do with caretakers, like you said, and mothers getting their life back. And this actually in the remaining of my questions have to do with this because I think not everyone also realizes that your child's type one diabetes is not in vacuum. How you deal with it is a very big part of how they will and how they'll succeed in their diabetes management. And it's not easy. And before I move to that, I just want to ask one um, last question. So the audience has all the information. Are there specific criteria that you looked for when looking for a camp or any deal breakers that had to do with the camp itself? Mm. That's a really good question. This one, because we had a recommendation and we did some research about it and it was, dare I say, geographically appropriate for where we were going to be, mm -hmm. um, that was helpful. I think, we did what we did do was call the camp before and we spoke to and they, they were very open minded about it. I think my husband spoke with one of the nurses. Um, you know, we looked at it on the map to find the location because they said, oh, there's a hospital right nearby, which there was if there, God forbid, if there's an emergency. So they were prepared. I would say even if you have a child without a chronic condition and you're going to send them off to a camp you want to make sure that there's a camp nurse, like things happen, uh, depending on how physical they are, what's going on, right? You want to make sure that there's, there's a nurse on site or some kind, or maybe it's a doctor on site, but some kind of medical attention. You want to make sure that, you know, they're, they're aware of the safety. You want your child to go and have fun and learn, but you also want them to be, to be safe. So even if Aaron didn't have diabetes, I would be looking at it. The risk manager in me is looking at it from safety perspective. So that was one thing. And then the other thing, what is it that they love to do? Like, so Aaron liked science and space when he was young and he's become very interested in architecture lately. And there'll be a time and a place where he explores that more after some of the classes he takes this year, if he thinks he still wants to pursue that. But we thought this could be a good fit because he likes science and he's very curious about it and he would learn something. And not every camp has to be so heavily academic, but it should be a subject that they can relate to or that they like. Um, other, you know, there's like music camps out there and maybe you want your child to go to a music camp, but if they don't play an instrument, unless they're gonna teach them how, or if they're really against it, that, that can backfire sometimes. Like in this case, Aaron was kind of against it because he was worried about it socially. But the look on his face when we picked him up, like his energy shifted. And when I saw him, I felt so much lighter myself even. I didn't carry the weight of the sadness in his face when we left him, but the he was just so he had so much fun the kids were all so wonderful and friendly and just really lovely when we picked him up and then we met some of the kids as well and they they were just all like fantastic so needs to be safe and it needs to be something your child enjoys i would mm -hmm. say those are the two most important things which actually is what you need to be sure of even if your child does not have diabetes because exactly. even if your child doesn't he'll probably be sad and scared going to a camp of course and you have to make sure that it's something that interests him and again you're emphasizing the fact that this was not just um, an experience related to diabetes it was a normal teenage experience for Aaron which is the goal for any mother with a child living with diabetes diabetes that he feels this way it's just mm -hmm. a part of his life um, now coming to you, I'm not even going to ask you if you were scared, even if you were this prepared, because I know that no mother wouldn't be. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I you're scared. You. Yeah. But yeah, I yeah. work with you. I see you and talk to you on a daily basis. Um, and I was when Aaron was off at camp and you were calm, you were like a rock and it did not get to you personally or professionally. <laughs> And it's impressive. And we just have to try to dissect that so other moms can reach that to one day or at least understand more how they can benefit from you in this area. Mm. Because we've seen it before with um, many mothers that 
the fear takes over their life. And many mothers, like you said, um, they can't sleep. You were able to move on from that, but they still can't. And apart from education or products, because we know these are core factors that help you and Erin be this calm and this confident, what else would you advise mothers? Um, does it have to do with taking care of your own well-being, for example, and how? Yeah, absolutely taking care of yourself. It's really true. We see it all the time and it sounds so cliche. Put the max oxygen mask on yourself first, right? Yeah. But living proof, you should do it. When I said I didn't sleep for years and as a result of that, and I had a very, you know, high paced, super stressful corporate job. And that coupled with caring for my child and not sleeping took its toll on my body. I had pneumonia. Um, and it would come to me every spring. And after the third year of getting pneumonia, I said, I can't do this anymore. I was exhausted. I don't know what I was running on. Even once I went to the doctor for general checkup, um, because, you know, I was always so tired and she did my blood test and, you know, low vitamin B, low iron. And she even looked at me. She's like, how are you still going? Like what you, you can't live like this. Like my own doctor was saying that to me and she, I've known her for a few years. So I was like, yeah, you're right. I can't. So that day or that month or around that time, I made the conscious decision. I didn't want to live with pneumonia anymore because I'm like, this is a seasonal thing. And every year it's getting worse and I'm feeling worse and I'm getting more tired, not helping anyone, not helping my son. I want to be able to show up and be awake and not just be exhausted when I have to go to a school function or something. Mm -hmm. So um, I started to, the first thing I did was I started drinking my green juice every day. I'm like, I apparently, I, I eat pretty healthy. I've always been healthy. My family raised me to have a healthy lifestyle. And I knew the importance of nutrition always. I knew the importance of exercise always. And I would still exercise and do things, but of course not like I used to. And I thought the first thing I would do is get more whole based plants in my life. Like I, I always say, I'm not going to tell you to be vegan, but having a green juice every day, that really seemed to help because I was not consuming enough fresh fruits and vegetables and anything green, any vegetable, any fruit, anything green, I was juicing it. Something about the color green. It, it just, it spoke to me. And then I was reading a lot about different juices and, and things like this. So I started with that and that seemed to help, but that, but having a fresh juice every day is really not even a drop in the bucket of what you need to do to care for yourself. I started to, and, and of course this happened over time because I was alone and I had to figure this out myself. I didn't have someone to hold me accountable, like a coach to do it. I, you know, started to exercise regularly again. I would you know, sign up for classes like in bulk that I liked so that I would commit. Even there was a time where I got a personal trainer so that I would be accountable and I'd have to go to, to exercise or do things. So first of all, I would look for accountability. Um, and I just made the conscious decision to really try to take my health back and, and do it. And it's, it's still not always perfect. Um, like since we've been back and the first week before school started, it's so funny because I was going to actually post something today. I did the provocative thing. I said, you know, I didn't really gain any weight on vacation. It's like water weight because we're active, we're walking, we're eating healthy. Since I've been back here, sitting in my chair, I gained two kilos more. Oh, I, I, seriously, this could be water. I don't know, but I've not really been able to exercise. And we're back here. We got the delivery. The groceries are even delivered. I don't have to walk to the market to buy anything. Everything's coming to me. So get up, get moving and, and move your body. That helps get out in nature. If you can, I know it's hot right now, but it's getting cooler. It's getting better. Um, do things that you love. Don't do it. If you don't enjoy it, like whatever activity it is that you choose, do it because it brings you joy. I can't say that enough. Um, I started, you know, running, running again was a big thing because I used to run a lot. I'm not a good runner. I'm not a competitive runner. I'm not even like a middle of the pack runner, but I like to run because I can go out, clear my head, sometimes listen to music. I like whatever it is like, but you, you have to find a way to 
take care of yourself because you will suffer and you will not be able to take care of your child. And, and forget the extra care part. It's just showing up for the daily things that your child needs you to do. And you don't want to be all angry and upset and, you know, biting their head off at the end of the day because you'll be, you'll still get frustrated with diabetes, but you'll get even more frustrated. And then you also don't want your child to see that because you want your child to have a healthy relationship with diabetes and you want to have a good relationship with your child and your, the rest of your family. You have so many demands. It affects everything. So again, it all comes down to the perspective or the conscious decision that you made to put your oxygen mask on first. <laughs> and yeah, that was it. That, that was absolutely it. And I'm, I'm still, you know, while I'm getting my son ready for school, I'm still in the process of doing that. So I'm looking at, I like to tap dance. So I'm looking, when's my tap class starting again? Um, I need to, you know, I want to start walking again. And, and when am I going to do that? And I'm in a book club. I don't have a lot of time to read the books. I, I, but I, you know, make the effort and, and you go in your social, like talking about something, not diabetes. Otherwise we sit here like head down, we're working all the time and, or we're doing diabetes all the time. And mm -hmm. then you, you get burnt out. It can't be easy. I mean, the mother's instinct, it had to start off. Um, like you said, with, I'm not even going to think of myself. I'm going to give all my energy to him because that's the best thing I can do, not care about myself and just give everything to my child. But then at some point you realize that's not sustainable in the long term and you just have to change that. And the journey from seasonal pneumonia and low iron levels and your doctor asking you how you're still going to now finding ways like tap dance and book clubs to stay happy and in turn take better care of your child, that was definitely a long and not easy journey. And I think that's the biggest concern for mothers, um, just moving, taking the con conscious decision that I'm going to put my oxygen mask on. Yeah. I and it's not, oh, sorry. And I was going to say, it's not even, you know, in addition to your own health and being able to take better care of your child, when your child sees you happy and healthy, mm -hmm. subconsciously, that also does something to them too, because you also need to set an example for your children mm -hmm. of how to do that. You don't want to set an example for your child where you're working and unhappy all the time or stressed out and unhappy all the time because they role model a lot after us and they they learn a lot from us. Even if we don't say it, they feel it and they see it. Mm -hmm. And we've seen, I think, with mothers um, that this is the biggest motivation that helps them when they're stuck in this unhealthy cycle of just neglecting themselves and then we remind them, but if you're happy and if you take care of better care of yourselves, then you'll take a better care of your child and they'll notice it and they'll be better too. And then that, then they're motivated to start thinking of themselves. Mm -hmm. so I think this is an important reminder, especially that for some moms, it's associated to guilt. They think that they don't have the right to take care of themselves, which is just definitely not true. It's hard. And and there there'll still be times where you might feel guilty. You think, oh, I should be here and not there. Like last night, there was a networking event starting at 7 p.m. I had a six o'clock uh, free workshop online and I left immediately after that to go to this networking event. And I thought I should stay home because Aaron's dad wasn't home yet from his meeting, even though he was on the way. You know, he's 14. He can stay by himself for a bit with the dog, right? If I was just going to take care of everything. Um, but then I thought I should really go and get out one to meet new people. It might be fun and just change the scenery and just do it. It's one night for like two hours. Not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Not, not a lot's going to happen in two hours. Yeah. So that's it from my side. Is there anything else you want to share about this experience or about Aaron in general? And I'm sure there's probably a lot I could, but I think we covered quite a lot. Like I, I can, you know, the, I could go on all day. Like any, no question is unanswered. There's, we live, eat, sleep, breathe diabetes 24 hours a day. And also now with Die Point, we're so happy to help and support other people with their diabetes. Um, but it's a, it's a never ending thing. So if you're listening and you have any questions, please feel free to 
drop us an email at info at diapointme.com. We'll answer any question, or if you need some support, please reach out. We're happy to support um, any, any way that we can. We have some exciting things coming up in the near future around that. Um, but as far as, you know, doing all the things, I think we've covered a lot and I don't know that there's anything else that I could add. I think you you hit it all That's or a lot of it. Thank you, because honestly, it is very inspiring and helpful um, and not just in diabetes context. I mean, I don't have kids, but I always tell my friends and people around me, I'm going to remember how Pamela dealt with her child's diabetes <laughs> because I will need these lessons and these perspectives at some point when I have children. I just know it's it's just about knowing how to take care of them, how to remember to keep them independent and how to take care of yourself. And it applies to many chronic conditions, not just diabetes. If it can be managed, it can be managed, mm -hmm. but it's about taking care of ourself in a holistic sense. Exactly. On the condition. Exactly. And we, we also want that for our children to like learn how to take care of themselves holistically and grow up healthy and as healthy as possible and happy and and do you know what what they love and you know I can't wait to see Aaron just started high school so let's see where life takes him but you know also I think knowing that you did everything that you could to prepare them for that next chapter is is so important and protecting them or oh, being overprotective as much as we want to do that, I still want to do that. You know, if even even in social situations where there were times where maybe, you know, Aaron was struggling with something socially, you just want to like say, oh, it's OK, like stay home, don't deal with it because you don't want to see them in pain and have to go through that. But they have to go through it so that they can learn how to, to deal with it and and focus on what matters. Otherwise, if they're not dealing with these small issues now, then they'll they'll seem huge when when they're older, and then they won't really know how to deal with it. So, so yeah, we just try not to be overprotective and everything in moderation, and support them to grow up. Yeah. It's very true. Yeah. Thank you so much for answering my questions. No, thank you for all the questions, and thank you for hosting this episode of the podcast. I think thank we might have you. a new co-host. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll prepare many lists for you <laughs> okay thank you so much everyone for listening I hope you enjoyed this episode as we might